Hello, today is August 3rd, and this is what I received from the Lord yesterday on August 2nd. Melissa, my child, do not fear. I am holding you in this place. I want you to begin your video about the seeds. I want you to explain that the letters on the bag represent the coming days. I want you to show them the parallels to the worship of the sun in Egypt. Melissa, the plagues, the trumpets, the mysteries reveal the exodus, the protection. Hear me, daughter. I want you to tell them I am coming back and I am filling their lamps with hope and desire. No, they cannot take credit for filled lamps. I do even this. Sing to me, daughter. Sing songs of rest and abiding because even hope and faith is a gift. I know the desires of your heart. Will I not give good gifts to my children? And uh, he said, you know, about the plagues. And I was just thinking about there's 10 plagues and then there's seven trumpets. So I was just wondering if, if 10, uh, if there's anything I need to know about 10. So I said, Lord, why 10 plagues? And he said, Melissa, the 10 plagues are the way to the sea. They brought people to a place where they desired deliverance. They were the last events to allow them to release. Follow my voice, you will know the answers. So he didn't talk about the 10, but he explained the purpose. Begin the video with a story about the virgins. Then begin to show them that the outpouring is available for everyone. It is happening, but people still have a choice of whether or not to receive. Calm your spirit, rest in me, and worship. You may go and prepare for this lesson. You will have all that you need. I am guiding this cart. I said, okay, Lord. I said, do you want me to read this message? Because it was instructional, you know. Melissa, do not fear. You can know the answer, yes. You may read this word to them. It is from me. I am the Lord, and I have spoken. And then he gave these scriptures, and as always, I will put them in the notes. The notes can be found under the video. There's a title, and then it says, read more. You just click that, and it opens up the box where the verses are copied for you. Jeremiah 31, 2, Psalm 21, Ephesians 2, 3, Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 6, Philippians 4, 1 through 2, 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 8, but Revelation 2, 26 through 29, I heard the words, final days, countdown commenced, figure this out. And I like it when he gives me talking points and where to start, because um, I can I can get kind of nervous about those things. So this is uh, a topic that I, I've known for some time that he's going to have me talk about this event, this day, and I just I kind of felt like. Maybe I was striving a little bit to try to figure that out when, and I didn't have to worry about that. He's he's brought it to my heart the last couple of days, and then yesterday he talked to me about it, and so I kind of knew it was getting time for this video. And this, I'm just going to walk you through the day on May 4th, and I'm just going to warn you, it's different. Okay, it's just kind of wait. I'm going to take you through the process with me exactly how how that day progressed and and then in the end you can look back and see that the Lord he was present the whole time even though it seemed like he wasn't so I he said to begin with the ten virgins so we'll talk about that so in Matthew chapter 25, I'm sure most of this audience knows about the ten virgins, but it's an end times prophecy. It's instructional for people who are living in the times of, of rapture and Jesus' second coming. And the, the end of Matthew talks a lot about those things. And it says that there were five wise virgins and there were there were five that ran out of oil and not too long ago one of my friends we were talking about that she's like well, what does that mean to you you know and I had an answer 
but it wasn't this answer. And this kind of blew my mind a little bit. I'd never thought of this. But it's one of those things that's, you know, it's a key hidden. For, for such a time as this, we couldn't understand it until it was happening. So the Lord is actually pouring out his spirit right now. Not everybody's looking at that and receiving that. So he said that we can't even take credit for the oil in our lamps. What is the oil? Oil is Holy Spirit in the Bible. That's, that's the symbology of it. Um, joy, hope, you know, the things that the Holy Spirit fills us with. And knowledge, wisdom, understanding. And so he's pouring his spirit out, but I'm noticing how many Christians have no idea this is even happening because they're, they're not looking. And it's, if you, you don't have to look very hard and you can see hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, I don't know, of people are having rapture dreams and visions and coming to the Lord simply because he appears to them in a dream, in a vision, um, and tells them to tell others that he's coming soon. And children, little children, are experiencing things and having dreams. And there's so many messengers right now. There's just all kinds of stuff. And then let alone, you know, just the signs of the times, you know, that the Bible lays out for us all around us. And there's so many people that say, well, everyone's always felt like that. And, you know, every generation has felt like he's going to return soon. So why is this any different? You know, I hope he does, but, you know, but that's not what we're told to do. We're told to, at the end it says, therefore, watch, keep, keep watch and wait because no one knows the hour or the day of his return. But if we're keeping watch, then we're receiving the outpouring, right? It's filling our lamps. But if we're not, the people that go and look for it, it's going to be too late. So, you know, once they realize, it's going to be too late. So, that's amazing to me. That doesn't mean that they're not, you know, going to the wedding. It just means that they have a different journey. You know, it doesn't mean they're not Christians. It doesn't mean that they don't love the Lord. But it's really important right now in this season that we be watching and waiting and, and we hold out our lamps for the filling. It's also important that we keep our wicks trimmed daily. So that he, he has said to me before, you know, keep the path between us clear and keep your wick trimmed. And he actually gave me a vision of, I thought it was like a DNA strand from my heart going upward to heaven. And I, I was looking at it, it looked kind of braided. I didn't know what it was and I asked and I just heard the word wick. So then I did a study on wicks and I learned so much, you know, he taught me so much just by saying the word wick and, you know, daily it's a trimming each day. We receive our daily bread from him each day. We got to trim off the stuff that makes our, our light dark, you know, the soot, the, the black stuff that, that accumulates on the wick. We got to keep it trimmed off every day and that could be anything. Bitterness, unforgiveness, those things are really important to get rid of and to just put them at the feet of Jesus. Burn them up on the altar and keep your light shining bright in these days. Keep looking for him. Keep keep being filled anew. Uh, there's just, there's such an outpouring right now. And so uh, that's where he wanted me to start. He wanted me to explain the plagues the trumpets, the mysteries reveal the exodus, the protection. So I've spent some time thinking about this. Um, so th he's, he's saying that the, the exodus is in the plagues that happened, you know, in Egypt to, to bring the Israelites out was a shadow and a type of the last day trumpets and the, and the vials and the wrath. So, you know, he explained that the reason that occurred was they brought people to a place where they desired deliverance. So, you know, the Israelites, they had lived there as slaves for 400 years. You know, they'd been there a really long time. So, you know, they definitely were influenced by the Egyptian culture. 
Um, and, and we can see that as they traveled through the desert, they kept building idols and things. So the Lord was, was judging the sin. And when we're attached to sin and he's cleansing sin, it hurts. Um, and, and so that was the last events to allow them to release, to make them want to leave. And also he gave them protection. You know, when the angel of death went over, he provided protection for them. And we can see that Moses and Aaron were a form of protection. They were leaders that, um, you know, they were, they're actually, Moses was a type of Jesus. You know, he, he protected a type and shadow of Jesus. And, and he was a form of protection over the people and leading them to the promised land. And in the end times, you know, there's going to be the spirit of Enoch and Elijah, the two witnesses. They're going to be a form of protection over the people that are here and being released from their captivity. Tell them I'm coming back and I'm filling their lamps with hope and desire. So, you know, we should, we should think about these things and think about what's actually happening. He doesn't wish that anyone would perish or be lost. It's all about salvation. It's all about cleansing. It's all about restoring us back to the, the thing we are created for. We are created to, um, to receive love from the Lord and to give love back to the Lord and to others. That's, that's our whole purpose. And when we have, you know, false idols and we're attached to the things on this side of the veil, they become blocks and barriers for the love that we, you know, we're intended to be connected to, to our, our creator. And, you know, we, we've talked about how we live on this side of the veil and we've talked about how our flesh is a type of a veil. We can see that in the tabernacle, right? When they put the animal skins over the, the tabernacle and then they had a blue cloth and those represent he revealed that to me. I never saw that. That that represents our flesh as a veil. And and the second heaven is a veil that's going to be torn open ultimately. So we're headed toward our final exodus. This whole experience is a wilderness experience. And there's types and shadows of that to teach us who we are and what this is about and what's going on. And, you know, a lot of times as Christians, we just read the stories, but we don't get the lesson, the deep lesson and the hidden treasure and the hidden truth that's right in front of our eyes. But it only can be revealed through the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, that's one of the ways of the Lord. He, he has these things for the seeker. He desires because, to, because if he just tells it plain out, it doesn't test the person's heart. And a lot of people won't believe anyway, even if he said it straight out. And so he's looking for faith that pleases him. He's looking for the seeker and he's looking for people who want to worship him in spirit and truth and uh, receive the Holy Spirit and receive the wisdom and the knowledge and the hidden, the hidden things. You know, we talked about how there are Christians, you know, who are in the outer court and they're worshiping there in the outer court. And, you know, they're going to heaven, they're safe. And how many of us have, have been in a place where we're just wanting, we just get comfortable. We get attached to, to this world, this earth, this experience, and we just don't want to be stretched. You know, we don't want to be stretched beyond the veil really. And, um, I just, I've been thinking about that. You know, the Lord, he's such a good shepherd. And each time he takes me to, um, the green pastures and I get to rest there and chew my cud and think about, you know, where we've been and, um, appreciate that he's he's taking me on this journey and I want to kind of stay there each time you know and then he takes me to the next place and I've got to learn to trust him in different territory and then I get to the next green pasture and I drink from the water and and you know I'm I'm restored and I'm reminded how good he is but then he takes me on the next journey and you know I how quickly I forget just like the Israelites that he is faithful Sometimes I think he's not there. Sometimes I think he's left me. Sometimes I, I think I've, um, I'm just 
not good enough. I'm not going to get it, you know? And then every time, so this whole story about May 4th is going to be exactly that. Okay, let me see where to go from here. Okay, I've talked about pieces of this event that happened on May 4th a couple times in the video. So some of you have already heard, you know, the worst of it. But I haven't told the story from beginning to end. And so this, I know, is going to challenge some of you, maybe a lot of you. It challenged me. It still challenges me. Um, sometimes we feel uncomfortable when we're stretched and our idea of God is stretched. And then we immediately shut down and say, God's not a God of confusion. And we toss it out. And that person must be speaking for the enemy, right? Like, that's kind of our tendency. And that verse, you know, we've talked about it before, is really taken out of context. God is not a God of confusion. It really, in that context, means he's a, a God of peace and unity and not discord and kind of anarchy. You know, he's not... He, he's a God of, like, the confusion that comes from upheaval, of uh, fighting, that kind of thing. So, the Lord often challenges us. And when we're challenged, you know, it's to develop our faith. It's to teach us deep lessons. It's to journey with him to deep, deep waters. And... In that process, there's confusion. There just is. I mean, you can see that from the beginning of the Bible to the end. People messed up. They didn't always understand the ways of the Lord, right? They didn't understand the, um, a lot of things. And I, I, I often think about the <clears throat> disciples and how much he, he said, do you still not get this? You know, they were confused. <clears throat> Excuse me, a lot of the time. So he, he doesn't create the confusion but he on purpose creates a challenge, right? Our, our confusion comes because we live in a veiled body, you know, and, and it's hard to see into the beyond this veil into the spirit. And, but the Holy Spirit, the disciples didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. Once the Holy Spirit came, you know, they, they really could see things a lot more clearly. And, but that's not to say uh, that they didn't experience their their challenges and still you know even then when the Holy Spirit came there was still um, some some disagreements and some confusion and so like you know Paul had to go and, and teach people and and get them set straight a lot so it's a it's a normal part of the faith journey to to wrestle and uh, what's important is that we just keep pressing in and that we are solid on the promises of God and that's that's going to be a main part of this whole journey that he is unchanging but in order to really understand who he is and um, I mean we're never going to understand until until we are fully free of the veil but but he can te teach us and take us deeper into understanding of him so this is the word that I received on May 4th My child, listen for me. Good morning. Yes, I am here. Follow my voice, Melissa. Do not work tonight. And, you know, sometimes when I get a word from the Lord, it's it's a little bit slower and contemplative. Like, I can, I can kind of think about, contemplate some of the things he's saying as it's happening. This was not the case. This came out so fast, and when I was done, I was like, what was that? Um, he's never asked me to not work. So... I knew it was important. Um, so he says, Melissa, do not work tonight. I have something for you to do. I want you to get up and go to the house, I tell you. Go to the garage and find a packet of seeds. There are two. I want you to take them to the house, I say, and tell them to plant them in their garden. Tell them I am coming soon. Tell them to watch the seeds grow and bloom. When this happens, they will know my return is soon. Listen to me, Melissa. You must do this. I am going to show you who I am talking about. The time is short, and I have people to reach. The time for my coming is here. The day will soon be here. Melissa, can you do this today? Melissa, do not be afraid. I am going to begin a work in you. Go to this home, sit with them, and explain to them that I am the way. I am the only way they can get to the Father. 
Sing to me a new song. I am going to place protection around you. I will give you words to say. You must follow my voice. Sing to me, child. Tell me. Tell them of my great love for them. Tell them I am the great I am. Tell them to become like children and listen for their father. Tell them to do this and I will speak to them. I love my children. Can you hear what I am asking? I said, yes, Father, I hear you. Melissa, can you hear me without your pen? I thought that was odd. I said, I don't know. So, right after I received that, my, um, you know, the home church I go to, it's a husband and wife. So she called me that day, right after I received that. And we talked for a moment, I don't remember about what. And I said, can I run this by you? Something very strange just happened. And I don't know if I'm crazy or not. And um, I don't know what it means. And I read it to her. And, and she said, well, let me get off the phone because, you know, you... I want to let you go and, and finish your assignment with the Lord. Sounds like he's, he's got something for you today. And, and, and she said, you know, it's, it sounds like prophet stuff, you know, and she's, she's much more mature in the faith. She's seen more than I have. And I didn't, I, I thought, okay, that's a thing. Like people experience this. I'm not alone, you know? And so that settled me a little bit. And but I was also like, wow, okay, <laughs> we're going on a journey today. And so I went out and I told my husband and he was sitting at the kitchen table and I, I just told him, I read it to him and he said, well, that I guess would make sense because I usually keep the seeds in the garage, but they're not there now. I, I brought them in the other day. They're on top of the refrigerator. There aren't any seeds in the garage. And he knows because he just remodeled his garage and it's really, really clean right now. And uh, he just built new cabinets and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, he knows where everything is. I don't, but I said, well, Lord, well, I said, well, the Lord said they're in the garage. So I'm going out to the garage. So I go out there and I'm looking around and I'm immediately overwhelmed by the task because it's my husband's garage. I have no idea where anything is. And um, there's all kinds of cupboards and things. So I'm just like, okay, Lord, uh, you're going to have to help me. Can you, can you show me? Well, guess what? That's, I started listening for him without my pen. I was out there, just him and I. And uh, so I heard, and when I say heard, uh, for some of you who haven't been following this channel very long, I don't hear an auditory voice. It, it actually is a still quiet voice. And what that means is it's more similar to a thought, but I, I experience it as a sense. So it's a sense that comes from a lower place in my stomach area and it's very still and quiet and it just emerges and then I process it in my thoughts. So it's not audible and I just tune into that, right? So when I'm writing, it almost is automatic. It, it's, it, he's trained me to, to recognize that sense, but it's, it's hard, you know, you, you really have to be quiet and still inside and just wait and patient. That's hard for me, you know, he had to teach me how to rest. So I'm out there and I'm trying to, you know, get quiet before him and he says, walk forward. I walk forward. He said, I get like kind of to the, to a wall. He says, turn left. I turn left. I take, you know, probably 15 steps or so. And he says, stop, look to your left, look up. And there's a cabinet there. And at the top of the cabinet, I see a bucket. So I got the step ladder and I climbed up and there was a bucket of Chinese chestnuts, which are seeds. I was like, wow, he took me right to some seeds. So I grabbed a handful and I went in and I showed my husband. I'm like, look, he took me right to him. And, but he said a packet and there would be two. So I was so confused. And then whenever that happens, I think I must not be hearing anything right. I must be making all of this up because that doesn't make sense, right? That's immediately my, my response. So I went back out again. I climbed up there and then I noticed that time to the left there's a small stack of items that my husband had saved of artwork and different things. And um but I didn't I didn't realize that at first all I saw was the top was a game, a Chinese checkers game. And what I noticed was it had a star of David on it, you know, the shape. 
And I noticed that because we had just learned the mystery of, of the triangles. So, and the mystery is when you put Jesus on the cross and you have pierced hands and feet and you draw lines that forms a triangle downward, it's heaven reaching down. And at Passover, the Exodus, when the angel of death went over and, and they were protected, they had to put blood on the doorpost and at the top. And if you draw a triangle there, it's people reaching upward for, for heaven. And then you put them on top of each other and you have the star of David. So that's just, and, we, and we've had dreams about triangles. So like just that jumped out at me, you know, cause he's been giving me pieces leading up to that point. And he's focusing me in immediately on China, you know, that's obvious, Chinese checkers um, and Chinese chestnuts right next to each other, two games of Chinese checkers, two boards on top of each other. And so immediately my mind is thinking about Passover and the cross. So um, then I, I, I got down and some of this might be a little bit out of order because it's been a little a little while, but I started to walk out and he said, Melissa, look to your right. And I looked over and my eyes focused immediately on Master Built. It was uh, our smoker and it says Master Built. And then right to the side of that, he has a big red uh, toolbox and it says Craftsman. And I just went into the house and I got in the Bible and I was just reading about the Master Builder and the Craftsman. It's just interesting that he's bringing this out now because we've just been talking about the master builder and the craftsman and seeds. You know, when you look up the verse about the master builder, like the, uh, I think it's in Corinthians and it's, it's about the farmer and the master builder together. And this is a lesson about seeds. And it's just like, I'm just having that revelation right now. It's like, he knows what he's doing. Like way back in May 4th, um, leading me and leading us to this place where things can start to fall into place and come together. So, you know, and then I went back out again and I, I was like, Lord, I don't want to be confused about this. Can you please help me understand? I know you can break through the veil. I know you can break through, um, you know, my, my dullness. Help me to see with spiritual eyes. What are you trying to say to me? So he took me back out there and he, he, um, he led me to where we keep, you know, I was walking and he said, turn. And, and so I walked into where we keep our chicken feed and our animal food. And I walked in there and he said, look down. And I looked down and I see black sunflower seeds. Well, also on top of that, where the Chinese chestnuts were, um, I also noticed a big metal sun and I threw it away, you know, it was in that stack. And it looked a little bit like, like an idol, you know, and I was thinking about, about those things and I threw it away immediately because I was like, Oh, I didn't know we had this on our property and it, I just didn't want it. So that was gone. And when I saw the black sunflower seeds, I, that triggered, I'm like the sun, black sun, Passover, the cross. So I went in and I read about all of that. And, you know, I think in Matthew 24, 29, it talks about the sun, you know, the sun going dark and, you know, they're all types and shadows and they're, they're repeat patterns of, of things that happen when the veil is torn and it's teaching us and preparing us for what's coming. So I journaled about all of those things, but still he's asking me to go to someone's house and I'm feeling like, I don't know what, what to say to these people. Like, what seeds am I taking? Um, I'm going to tell them to plant them in their garden. And when they bloom, you know, I'm going to explain all that to them, I guess. Uh, so I'm just trying to figure this out. And, but now I've got the black seeds and I've got the Chinese chestnuts. I've got two seeds, um, and the bag's more like a pack so that I'm not sure. Is it one of each? Is it, you know, I don't know. And then I look down and I see corn kernels. So now I'm like, great. Now there's corn kernels right at my feet. Maybe I looked at the wrong thing. So I take all of them in and I lay them before the Lord. I've got, I've got three types of seeds here, God, <laughs> like what help me. And, and then I just waited and then I hear the ones that are marked. So I'm literally looking at the seeds, trying to figure out what he means by marked. And I'm feeling so stupid and so like, 
how is he ever going to break through to me? Like, this is impossible. It's impossible to talk to an unseen God. I can't do it. <laughs> and um, so then I, I realized, I went back out and I looked at the bags. The, the corn seed bag was unmarked. It was just a white burlap bag, no markings on it whatsoever. And uh, from a feed store we go to, and then the the sunflower seeds had the writing. I'm like, there's the marked bags, bag. So I'm focusing mostly on the sunflower seeds. I think that's what he's saying. And I look it up and I see that in Israel, sunflower seeds are actually in bloom in May. So that makes me think that's what he's talking about. And then I notice that they are in bloom in August here where I live. So I just journal about that. And I do look up, you know, that the Chinese chestnuts, um, they actually produce a lot of food, you know, a friend told me. They're a good source of food when when things might go bad. Like, maybe people should be pl planting Chinese chestnuts. Maybe that's what he was saying. Uh, and they take, you know, four to five years to bloom. So I was thinking, well, maybe, you know, that's talking about when that, they're both, um, like, represent maybe r rapture soon, when the sunflowers in, are in bloom, and, and then the second coming, or his, you know, his, his, return, I, I don't know, second coming, third coming, however you want to look at that, you know, the final return um, is more the Chinese chestnut. So I just didn't know. Those were some thoughts. I'm not saying, um, I'm just trying to figure out what he's, what he's telling me here. And he's giving us, he's giving us seeds here. He's giving us, um, and keys and clues like he likes to do. And you know, so there's a literal meaning, but what I wasn't seeing was this is also a parable. I had no idea about that. Um, but that's, you know, when you read the Bible, that makes sense because there are times when the, when the prophets, especially, I always think of Elijah or um, Ezekiel, uh, he had to do some weird things and perform some weird things and they actually were a parable or represented something. So I actually went out and I took everything down from the top of that shelf and I took pictures and then I put it all in my car because I didn't know. I didn't know if I was going to need any of that. I, I felt like he was pointing to some of that. That's why he led me to those seats first. I thought it was really pointing me to this pile of things because as I went through them, they seemed so significant. Um, immediately things were were being revealed in my mind um and now as i look back even more you know as he's taking me on this journey there's just different things for example there's a picture of um a, a an ocean that's you know has has high waves in it and i i often have that feeling of being tossed about you know but he's been teaching me how to to stand on truth and to be not tossed about, you know, and um, and then so there's a picture of an ocean that's really quiet with rocks to stand on above the ocean, you know, and you know just things like that. And there's a, a woman sitting by still quiet water, you know, when he taught me to rest and just some things. It's just like wow. There's even a picture of a sunflower that a kid colored in there. And when I walked out, the first thing I didn't notice it at first, but like if you were paying attention when you look up the overhang there was a piece of cardboard it said America on it and then you climb up and then it says China what is that saying and then my my son he drew a picture when he was three or four for some reason my husband saved it up there oh I know why because I asked him I asked my son what it was he said it's a target and there's a picture of a war with a date of February 15th which, which a lot of people say was the midnight cry and um but anyway, uh, it was a target because I guess my son was shooting something at it. Uh, so it must be, that's why they saved it. And, uh, but anyway, just, I mean, the, I don't know. I'll, I'm going to put the slideshow at the end of all the things and you can decide for yourself if he's, oh, and I forgot the most important thing. There's a game of clue up there with a thumbprint. You know, we've been talking about identity and, uh, so like 
hello, I think he's giving us clues. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of back and forth. I kept going out there and back inside and talking to the Lord and going back and coming back inside. I'm not going to read through all of that. But he did eventually say that I was going to go to the house of the Edwards and that I needed to just rest and worship and listen for him because he was going to tell me when it was time to go. And I'm not exactly sure. It was before my husband got home from work, but I knew it was getting close to dinner time. So I imagine 4.30, 4.45, he said, okay, it's time to go. So I, you know, I had all my stuff in the car ready. I had the seeds and the, the stack of things. And I was just completely going in faith and still really not sure. You know, he gave me some words to tell them um, about salvation and uh, instructions for them, you know. So I just took my folder and I was off. And, and again, I'm faced in, with an experience of having to listen to the Lord without my pen. So I'm being stretched here. We're going out into the wilderness together. So here we go. And I get to the end of my driveway and I feel him say, turn left. So I'm driving and all of a sudden, maybe a mile up the road, he says, get ready up ahead to turn left. And right when he said that, I went by a house that had a sign and I thought, oh, did I miss it? And I went back to look at the sign, you know, hoping it was Edwards and it was that easy. No, it said Ferguson. So the next road up ahead was to the left was Ferguson Road. And then the Holy Spirit put it in my mind, follow the signs. So I'm driving down this road and I start doubting because I've been down this dirt road one time and I can't, it looks like it just ends and I couldn't remember if it really went anywhere. So then I start to think, oh, it's a dead end. I'm not hearing from the Lord. And, um, and then the, that, a th uh, there was a, a thermometer out there and it said on there, go the extra mile that popped into my mind to keep going, go the extra mile. So I keep driving. And in my mind, the Holy Spirit put the song, I'm going to catch the breeze from heaven. You're the wind in my sails. And that literally kind of gave, gave me this lifted out of like just very out of body kind of experience. I'm just like feeling like he's the wind in my sails, like leading me along. So part of my mind is still like observing all of this, wondering if I need to go to a mental institution. And then part of me is just trust, trusting him. And so every decision, you know, every time a road would end or there'd be an intersection or something, there's always a sign there pointing. And sometimes there's trees marked. I just followed those things for about 20, 25 minutes. And all of a sudden I get to an intersection and I realize exactly where I am. And I think, this is like five minutes from my house. Why, why would he take me this roundabout way? And I, I immediately shut down. I just, I doubted. I, um, I thought there's no way that he would have taken me this way. That doesn't make any sense. If he wanted me to be here, he would have taken me this other way. And how many times do we question the ways of the Lord? Cause they're not our ways. You know, they don't make sense to our logical brain. Cause we think we've got, we're so smart. And um, so I get there and a minute ago. Remember how dumb I thought I was? <laughs> now I'm thinking I'm so smart. He wouldn't have done this. So then um, I turn around. I turn around. I start backtracking. And I backtrack and I, I kind of repeat some of it. I go new places. I'm completely lost. I, I don't feel connected to him. My anxiety is so high. And I'm just wondering, like, there's just, there's, there's no way this is going to work. I, how am I going to find the Edwards? I'm going to knock on every door. I've been looking at mailboxes. Nobody has their name on their mailbox that I can find. And I'm just like, just driving around aimlessly. And then it occurs to me, I've heard of somebody, you know, getting a picture of where they're supposed to go, um, or something like that. So I just think, Lord, can you give me a picture? A picture of a house at least what am I looking for so I see a picture in my mind immediately of a white farmhouse just off the road to my right and it's uh, on this side of my head and it's um, up on a little bit of a bank so the the lawn is on a hill a little bit and and then it's gone so I'm like okay well you know I live out in the country like every other house is a white farmhouse so 
I was like, oh, I probably just made that up too. So, um, so anyway, I eventually stopped at a dandy and I'm just like, Lord, I need help. Like, I just, I got my pen out, you know, cause I'm desperate. I can't hear you this way. It's too hard. So I start writing and he says, go back to the beginning and retrace your steps. Go back to that first road. You'll know what to do. He said, so I'm driving along and I just remembered when I thought of the go the extra mile. So I, I calculated a mile from there and I stopped at that mile and he said, look to your right, look up. And I stopped and I looked up and I was amazed. There was this boulder at the top of this hill just placed there, this big, huge, solid rock. And I just sat there for a while and I just thought about the rock, you know, what that means. And he's talked to me about that before, you know, he's placed rocks in front of me before. And, um, you know, he's taught me that lesson a little bit. And so I'm just like, oh, Lord, thank you. And then I drove a little bit further. And this house that I actually went and knocked on, um, and thank goodness nobody answered their doors because I knocked on a few doors, but nobody answered. Thank you, Lord. And there was a, a full rainbow over that house. And I drove a little bit further and there was an eagle in the road right in front of me. And I was just like, wow, what is the lesson in that? And later, you know, I, I journaled about it. I talked to a friend about it. And, you know, when we are lost in the wilderness, go to the rock. Jesus is truth. He's the way. Go stand on that rock. Stand on it and remember the promises. The promises I rely on a lot is I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will not let you fall. You know, I make mistakes. I stumble, but he's not going to let me out of his grip. You know, he's holding me. He's not going to let me fall like away is what that means ultimately. Yes, I make mistakes I'm every step of the way. You know, I'm tripping, but he's not going to let me fall away. And, um, you know, those, those are the promises, you know, I stand on because, and in the promise that he says that he is doing this work in me and he's going to finish it, darn it. He's going to finish it. He is the author and finisher of our faith. And he works all of this crazy stuff out for good. You know, those are the promises I go up there and I stand on it and I remember those promises and I get lighter and then I can soar above the wilderness and I can I can know that he's working even though I can't see it or understand it. His ways are higher. He's doing something. I can rest. I can just abide. I can just be present with him. And even though it seems like I'm abandoned, he's here with me. He's watching me closely. And um, so I did that, but I still wasn't any closer to understanding where the Edwards were. So I drove around literally till it was about dark. And then I just went home because I'm not going to anybody's house, knocking on doors when it's dark out. Like that's crazy. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. So I, um, it's all, it all seems a little crazy. I know. So I get home and my husband's like, well, you know, because in the morning he kind of knew some of the instruction, but he didn't know about the Edwards that came later. And I told him, and he's like, really? Because there was, I just noticed that somebody called at six o'clock and their name was Edwards. I was like, really? That's weird. Um, but I was like, well, I'm going to bed. And he's like, well, talk to me about it. I'm like, nothing happened. I just drove around lost for hours. It's ridiculous. I have no idea what the lesson in this is. I feel like I failed. I can't do this. I'm going to bed. And um, so I, I had a sour attitude. I had, I was kind of, afraid of him. I felt disappointed in the whole thing. I felt disappointed in myself that I had so much anxiety. I couldn't hear him. Um, I just felt like it was impossible and that our journey was over kind of, you know, that's, that's how I felt. I woke up the next day and a Abe's mom called and said, you know, I heard you guys had some activity out there by your house, you know, everything. Okay. Like, you know, just talking to us and Abe's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But then he remembered when he was driving home from work sometime around 430 cop cars went blazing by him and his mom explained, now this is where it gets hard because I don't want to be, whew, oh, it's just a stick. <laughs> I don't want to be insensitive at all. Um, to this situation is horrific and, um, God is not done with the situation. He is working 
and he sees this family. He loves this family. And as I tell you this story, I just want all of us to lift this family up and just surround them in prayers. That something miraculous, you know, God is a God of miracles and he takes he takes graves and he turns them into gardens. That's who he is. And he sees his family and he loves them. And he's got big plans for this family. I know it. So she explains the situation in, um, where a boy is running from the police. I don't have the details. I don't, I've heard different things. I'm not going to talk about the details of who's at fault or what. But it's just tragic that this 15-year-old kid, I think he's 15, ran, pursued by the police, and shot and killed literally less than a tenth of a mile from where I was when I turned around. And probably right at that moment had I driven, I might have seen him run across the road. Like when I put the pieces together, I looked at the paper and the time frame. I was right there. He took me right there. And I doubted and I turned around. And I, when his mom said where it was, I'm like, I think I was right there. She said the names of the roads and everything. And I went there. And when I realized, and it all came together, I just sobbed from the depths and I carried that burden. I thought that that was my burden. I thought that I, I was the reason he wasn't alive. I was supposed to take Jesus to the family. I was supposed to be there. I wasn't supposed to doubt and turn around. I was supposed to have faith and be used by him, you know, for something, um, to save someone's life. And I was so upset by this. I, I couldn't talk to God for a couple days. I was so afraid of him. I was so ashamed of myself. I was so like, God, if you wanted that to happen, wouldn't you have prevented that? Who are you? What what can you do and what can't you do? Why couldn't you break through to me? And I was confused because their name isn't even Edwards. So what is this all about? Was that just coincidental? Could that be coincidence? He says to go right then and takes me that way and that's where I am when all of that happens is like nothing like that's happened around here that I know of. Not in my community. And this is a kid, you know, where I substitute teach. Like, you know, I've seen him. I, I know, who, I don't know him, but I know of him. And it's just like, it's so awful. So I go to church Sunday night and I'm sitting at the counter kind of by myself. And, uh, one of my friends comes over and, uh, who, who the Lord uses profoundly in my life a lot, you know, for the breadcrumbs. <laughs> These two women. It's amazing. So she goes, how's your week? And I said, interesting. She says, tell me about it. I'm like, I don't think I can. I don't know what to say about it. I'm in a very weird place with the Lord. I don't even know how to process any of this. And she's like, well, try. I want to hear about it. So she sits down and she gets cozy with me, you know. And I'm like, okay, it's very weird. You know, I, I lay it out for her and she just listens and she says, you know, that reminds me of, of scavenger hunting with the Lord. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She, she said that she's never done it, but she's heard of it. My dogs are out here barking like crazy. There better not be a bear or something. So, um, where, where we stop, please. Shh. So she told me about a story of a girl that she knows. And when she was in youth group, they, they asked, they practice this. It's, it's about tuning into the Holy spirit and receiving pieces as the body, you know, we're the body and we're all connected to the mind of Christ that came up at church the other night. What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? Well, one thing it means that, is that he is the head, right? And we're the body. And so the way we unite as a body is that we all have the ability to, you know, have the Holy Spirit, which searches the mind of Christ. 
So the more we are in tune and have his mind and let let him drive and, and be the thinker, and um, the more we unite because we have the same head. We're, we're looking to the same, the same Jesus for our instructions, and then we can operate as a body. So, you know, it's an exercise of that. So they're sitting around as a body, and they just prayed to the Spirit to, to reveal things to them, and then they put the pieces together and try to see what the Holy Spirit's teaching them. Sounds pretty awesome. So in this situation, they did that, and they, they ended up driving more than an hour, I think, from where they were, and the Holy Spirit took them right with the clues, took them right to the doorstep of this girl's biological family she'd never met before. Like, that's amazing. So that's the story she shared. And I was just like, it really shifted my mind. Like, oh, so maybe, maybe he's not done. You go, she said, you know, what if, and I showed her the pictures of the things, the clues. And she said, you know, what if he's asking us at church to practice this? Maybe he wants us to start practicing functioning as a body in this way. And so we talked about that, just the two of us. And, you know, that was interesting. And So then, so then we go and we have, we have church and I've told this story before too. So my husband's sitting in the corner, we're eating, he's reading a book quietly that night and the, the word Edward Scissorhands comes into his mind and he's like, shoo, you know, like immediately he thinks it's the enemy. And isn't that true? And I've, I've said this before in this example, because it just hit me so profoundly. Like we always are taught that the enemy attacks with the fiery darts. We're just constantly under attack from the enemy. And he's the only one that influences our thoughts. But if we think the Holy Spirit's talking to us, like, no, you get that from the word of God. No, there's Rhema word. He speaks to us. That's a thing. Is the, is the enemy more influential over our mind than the Lord? Like he has that ability to speak directly to us. Like that is something that happens and it's biblical. So, but anyway, that my husband struggles to believe that the Lord's speaking to him. And the rest of us kind of chuckle because uh, the Lord clearly speaks to him a lot. But not necessarily through the rhema word, but through the word of God, through um, his daily devotionals. The Holy Spirit's guiding him and leading him and speaking to him all the time. He, he's, he's held him this whole time, taught, brought him through this journey that's amazing. But, um, you know, doesn't experience the rhema word as much. So, so later the pastor's talking and he says, um, you know, when I, he's kind of joking with another uh, retired pastor who's there, who used to be his, his pastor and he grew up under him. He said, when I first, when I was a baby Christian, you know, I went to this church and, and when he would preach, I just felt like he was pruning me down to nothing. I, I just felt like branches were flying. He was like, Edward Scissorhands, cutting this off and this off and this. And Abe was like, Edward Scissorhands, I think I heard from the Lord. So he shared that and we're all cheering, you know, because that's, that's huge for him. And how, you know, people think the Lord wouldn't say Edward Scissorhands. The Lord will say whatever he wants to say. Everything belongs to him. It's all his to utilize however he wants to. So um, I'm just, that's a, that's just, a teaching point for all of us don't dismiss things just because they're out of the box like let's stop putting him into this box well guess what the word was Edward so it didn't occur to me but the woman that called me this is how the body works right they get different pieces and um so she the woman that called me the day when I received this this instruction and and she normalized it you know and, and told me to go do it she said, so I wanted to know, how did that all turn out? And I'm like, well, and I explained the whole story. I explained about the Edwards. And I, I did say, I looked up the name Edwards, just in case it has to do with that. You know, it's kind of a parable or something. And, and I said that I found that Edward means, it's, it's people who look out for the needs of others. Basically, people in a community who look for people who have needs and they fill them. And then she goes, Edward Scissorhands, Edward. There it is again, you know? And so then I'm like, wow, Edward's called, Edward Scissorhands, the meaning of Edwards, 
I think that's what the Lord's trying to say here. It's a parable. And so then my mind just starts changing a lot. And I'm just like, I'm so sorry, God. Like, you're still working. And you're being gentle about it. But this situation is very confusing. You know, like, this is terrible. Like, why did you... So I ask him in the spirit, Lord, why, why did it turn out this way then? Why did you let this happen? Why? What's the lesson in that? And he said, Melissa, I wanted to show you in a profound way so that you could tell others. I wanted to show you what is possible if people will just listen to my voice and not doubt me. I wanted to show you what was possible. In that message, remember, he said he was going to protect me. Sing to me a new song. When I understood that, he was protecting me. So, he knew. He knows. It's not like he's going along the journey with us, being surprised when we're surprised. He's already at the end, ready to catch us. He already knows the choices we're going to make, and then he, he makes it into something somehow. But he knows. He already knows. He teaches us through it. He's not surprised. So when you fail, when you feel like you fail, no, he's not surprised. He's got something. He's got something there for you. He, he works it all out for our good. So when we started talking about Edward Scissorhands, like what does Edward Scissorhands represent? He represents a, sh a person with shame who's hidden away, who feels like an outcast, who doesn't belong in this world, who there's no place for him. But really, he's very unique and has such um, a gifting, and he has a purpose, and he was made that way for a reason, you know? So both things, it's everybody. We're all that, and we're all also um, created for love. We're created to receive God's love and to love him back and to love others. We're vessels for love. So we're Edwards, too. You know, we're both the things. It's everybody. It's a message for everybody. God. So let me pause and see if there's anything else. Yes, there's definitely something else. So then, you know, I find out who this family is and I am shocked at the connections that I have to these people. I didn't know, you know, I didn't really know the boy. Like I recognize this picture. I'd seen him in school. I didn't know there's two kids. I've, I've substituted before I was pregnant and then I took a big break and then this last year I took like five years off and then this last year I substituted again or four years or something and um, when I was pregnant and I was about to have him um, his birth my son's birthday is in June so I was very pregnant and uh, toward the end of the year and I had a seventh grader and he he had some behavioral issues, but I didn't ever had any problems with him. And, and we just bonded. Like he would come in and be like, my favorite substitute. And he would tell me about his vacations and different things he was doing. And he would always ask me about the baby and what am I going to name him? And I would ask him like, what are the keys to being like a great boy mom? Cause I had no idea about boys and, um, you know, stuff like that. And, and later I found out that he, my husband's mother, is best friends with this boy's grandma. So even when I wasn't substitute teaching, I got to see him once in a while at family functions and I was always glad to see him. You know, always hug each other. He felt like family to me. Then when I go back, there's a little girl that I kind of have the same experience with. Like she, I don't know, for some reason I just had this, she has real curly hair. She's real cute. And, um, I just learned about like curly hair because I didn't know my hair was kind of had some natural curl to it. So I, I talked to her about it, like this new uh, YouTube channel I found, you know, and that just established something between us. And she she wrote it down. She wanted to go tell her mom because her mom hates her hair and her hair is curlier than hers. And and so we would talk, you know, after that and see each other in the hall and wave. And she's just a little seventh grader and a happy little girl. And um but we had like this little rapport with each other and that doesn't happen with everybody you know in high school and your substitute teacher like you're just kind of like I try but a lot of them just stare at you you know and there's a few that that 
engage in that um you know i have a relationship with but this this little girl and this this boy have always stood out to me it just i had a lot of love for them and now i know god established that because i find out that that's the little girl's um brother so i took a meal to their house i left it at the door i left a note and then i went to the funeral and she was sitting under the tree with some of her sisters and her friend and um, she saw me and she just knew I was there for her. You know, she just jumped up and came right to me, gave me a big hug and just was crying in my arms. And I'm just like, God, what, what is this about? You know, I go inside and there's the boy, you know, he's grown up now. He's 18. I don't know how old he is. And I'm like, what are you doing here? He's like, this is my brother. And I knew his mom's side. I didn't know anything about his dad's side. It's his half brother. So I give him a big hug. And I'd just been to his mom's funeral. I'm like, we've got to stop seeing, you know, running into each other here. And there's a whole picture board of him with his little brother, you know. And I'm just like, so I know he's not done. I know this is all, it's in his hands. No. He, he knows what he's doing. And so I can rest. So I was at such a place of unrest. But now I'm just going to rest and listen for him. Like, use me anyway, Lord, in this situation. And the next day, I wake up. You know, I'm doing my worship after this funeral. And a song comes up about, you know, let me tell you about my Jesus. It's about a little girl who loses her brother. And the fa the parents, she told me. She said, I said, How's, how are your parents doing? She said, not well. You know, they're... They're not handling it well. My mom especially. I'm like, of course, you know. And this whole song is about from this little... I've never heard of this song. I don't listen to music like that really. But it's a, a music video. It's Christian. And it's about the little girl's perspective after she loses her brother. And so, you know, I sent that to her. I said, you know, this just showed up today. This is how the Lord works. And I think this is for you. You know, so I was able to, to share that with her. And, um, you know, I... I left an invitation. I, I need to probably reach out again and seek the Lord on that. But I left an invitation, you know, if she needs anybody, you know, and can think of anything I could do for her. But so there's that. Let me think if there's anything else. I'm going to wrap up with these thoughts. So yesterday I uh, was able to take a friend to some doctor's appointments. She just had knee surgery. And I actually was able to share some of the story. It's a little bit of practice, you know, because it's been on my heart. I, I knew it was coming time. I'm going to have to share this. So it was nice to be able to um, to share some of that, collect some of the thoughts, practice it a little bit. It's just it's been a, a hard one to, to figure out, you know, how to sh how to share. So hopefully there's something for you there. Hopefully walking through that experience helped you to normalize, you know, some of those wilderness experiences where we just like the Israelites forget, he's taking care of us. He's holding it. He just wants us to trust him. He's given us the, the daily, he's meeting our daily needs abundantly. And he didn't take us there to leave us there. You know, that's what we always feel like. We feel like, why'd you bring me here to just leave me? He didn't. And he doesn't. And that's a promise. Stand on the rock. Remember the promises so that you can be light. Well, I'm going to finish with the song. Remember that he gave me that song on the journey. And uh, when I went back and listened to the song and remembered that's the song he gave me, he's so good. When we think we get scared, who are you, God? Why would you let that happen? No, his character is nature. He's so good. He's so gentle. He's so loving. The Wind of Heaven is the name of the song. I'll put this in the notes and I'll put that um, Let Me Tell You About My Jesus song in the notes along with the scripture. The first thing says, I don't have to be perfect. You are my righteousness. You're lifting off the heavy burdens. Your yoke is easy and light. Praise be to the Lord our God who daily bears our burdens, our God who saves. We're going to catch the breeze of heaven. You're the wind in my sails. You're taking us to higher places. I will not stumble and fall. 
So as we walk this out, as we walk out these days, we can be scared, right? We can have fear. We want to be with our Lord, but we can have fear because what if he does forget me? What if he does let a hair on my head be harmed? There's, there. I don't know what the future looks like. He says, don't worry about tomorrow. He's already there. And he did make promises. He's Not one hair is going to be harmed. The, the wrath isn't for us, okay? We've got to tell people. We've got to warn them so that the wrath's not for them either. We've got to wake up the sleepy virgins. Church, wake up. Look. Just open your eyes. Do a, a search. One thing. Look up rapture dreams and you will know. His sp spirit is being poured out right now. This is not normal. This is not how how um, it has always been. Look at the signs. Look at what's going on. Listen to what he's saying. I have two binders of stuff trying to help you sleepy church. He loves you. Wake up. And he's got lots of messengers all over the place. Tune into them. He's speaking. He wants you. He wants you to go. He wants your oil lamps full. He wants you receiving the spirit he's pulling, pouring out right now. Oh, Jesus, Lord, Holy Spirit, thank you for that um, journey. And we lift up that family, Lord. Put your protective wings over them and just let them know you are watching them. That this isn't all that there is. And you have treasures in heaven in store. You know, for those that, that choose you. And Lord, help this family choose you if they don't know you. Help them choose you. Help them to put all of their hope in you. And none, none of this goes to waste. None of it. You've got abundance. But it's a choice. All right, I love you all and we'll see you in the next video.